pieces of stuff at the start of this speech that I think knock out a huge amount of material brought to you by OO. The first is, sorry, by opening government. The first is to say that the governments in these countries can still regulate the absolute worst instances of predatory banking behaviour for the reason that obviously what we're talking about is compliance with Sharia law. Things like actively exploiting people with massively predatory loans and things like that just falls outside of the scope of that, meaning the government still has all of the incentives they put to regulate it. The difference is, is that when individual banks are looking at their own kind of Sharia law, you don't get things like an asset of harms to things like competitiveness because the ways in which they offer services and comply with Sharia law are totally centralised and only determined in one way. The second thing to say is to talk about how these banks actually make their money because it knocks out the last few minutes of Archie's speech. Islamic banks cannot charge interest on loans. They cannot do things like speculate uh, in compliance with Sharia law, which means that you, don't that you necessarily do not get all those harms and I think that knocks out like the last minute of Archie's speech quite nicely. Two arguments then. One, on the governance of these banks and secondly, on their service offerings. On better governance, we think that you get far better compliance under our side when banks individually work out how to comply with Sharia law. The first reason for this is they're far less likely to be corrupt. Obviously, when you have one central regulatory body that is within the government that totally controls that, they're far more likely to do things like regulate things corruptly. But even if they have like an internal regulator, they are far less likely to call out corruption when it actually occurs because obviously the government is personally responsible for that corruption, which means that if like corruption happens on their watch, they're far more likely to do things like lose elections and things like that. They have far less of an incentive to call it out. Also, the government still has the ability to earn a huge amount of revenue uh, from these banks by regulating them in certain ways. So they're far likely to do that. And we think that you're far more likely to, uh, it, sorry, you think in these, it, sorry, um, yeah, which is far more likely in those instances. Uh, because also the government has a vested interest in making it look like their compliance is far greater in like with faith and stuff like that because religion typically tends to be it's quite a significant electoral issue so the interest in making it look like they're compliant in the strictest kinds of ways is also particularly important because that is likely to be particularly electorally popular the second thing to say though is that the individuals on the boards of these banks regulating the compliance have their own personal interest in maintaining their own faith given that a they're likely to be uh, like of islamic faith and therefore like have an interest religiously in maintaining uh compliance with sharia law because it's like you know uh that the, their like spirituality and religious identity is tied up in that. But secondly, we would say that this interest is far greater for individuals on the boards of individual banks than it might be for people that are members of the government. Because A, there are far less competing interests given that the profiteering incentive which probably goes both ways. They do not have things like an, a, other like electoral incentives to hide, like hide things. But secondly, we would say, so thirdly, we would say that when your compliance with Sharia law becomes a point of competition and your bank is like a more moral and a more better and a more like religiously compliant bank when you are more compliant, that means you have a far greater competitive incentive to look more compliant with things like Sharia law and to look less corrupt than other banks and to play a, a, a better form of Islam with other banks, which means that you necessarily, this becomes a point of competition for Islamic banks. We would know that this is something that necessarily only occurs when there can be differences in the types of ways that banks comply, which is a unique benefit to like side opposition. Uh, for the reason that like, um, obviously there is only one way that you could like do compliance that's regulated by a central regulator. Um, I'll take the point from those. Is the average consumer capable of looking through the opaque regulation of the bank and determining if it likes the way that the bank is complying in order for there to be competitive pressure between banks to do this well? Yeah. I think looking directly at like the things that a bank publishes about their compliance is not the only way that consumers access information about its compliance. Obviously, given that banks are very significant financial institutions that are often subject to a large amount of media scrutiny, it's often things like an electoral issue. It is just largely accessible broadly through the media, at least the biggest ways in which banks are like compliant or non-compliant. And this information generally is quite accessible to consumers and the consumers generally have a direct interest in accessing that information and seeking it out for the reason that their money and livelihoods are often tied up in the ways that these banks are run. And this information is like generally likely to be quite accessible. Second argument in this speech then is about service offering. The frame um, here is that obviously like I think that Archie's characterization of, these, of the government having a broad church and pluralist interpretation of Islam is something that is untrue. And that when you have a central regulator, you have to have consistent regulations, which thereby force you to subscribe to one interpretation of the ways in which you comply with Sharia law, which necessarily means the banks are unable to tailor the ways in which they comply with certain parts of Sharia law, say, to the regional like, subscriptions to various parts in this. And it's particularly bad for the reasons that Archie tells you in his speech, given that there is generally a lot of, like, the interpretations of Sharia law tend to be pluralist. It is a living and spoken text. So it's particularly advantageous for banks in different regions of different countries that maybe have different ways of interpreting a different parts of the Quran to be able to comply in different ways so they can tailor their service offerings to the customer base they're offering to, uh, which is particularly important, which means that perhaps in like the most kind of like conservative areas, they're able to, uh, you know, maybe have like fewer service offerings because it's more strictly compliant. But in like the more like liberal areas, they can have better service offerings. I know this just massively flips the material on OG because they think that it is a harm to be able to pick and choose the ways you comply to be more 
more efficient and more effective in your service offerings. It is deeply, deeply unclear to me why that is a harm. I think that is a huge benefit to be able to like, suit those inter methods of interpretation. The second thing to say though is that, uh, um, yeah, sorry. The second thing to say though is that when you have less direct government control, you're far more likely to be more internationally competitive. That is for the reason, firstly, that individual people that are able to do Plan, able to A, better spread their capital and better balance the business interests and profiteering interests of banks uh, with their interests in complying, which is they're likely to, more likely to hit a happy medium as opposed to a government that has a far greater interest in just look at they are far more strictly and blanketly compliant. Uh, but secondly, you're far more likely to want, given that you have a competitive incentive to expand your bank and to like venture out, you're far more likely to do things like set up branches in other countries that uh, maybe a government of, of, of another country wouldn't want to because they're not Islamic countries or because they don't perceive that as being like their natural interest best in those countries. Which is a benefit in and of itself because it gives these banks access to more customers and more capital and allows them to grow and buy better service offerings for people that live in their own countries. But secondly, you just get more people like uh, willing to operate these banks. But thirdly, we would suggest that when there is less government intervention in Islamic banks, you are far more likely to have other foreign countries approve those banks opening in those countries when they're non-Islamic. And this is a huge benefit, and this is like for a few reasons. The first is just obviously that when there is less government uh, control over entities, other countries that like maybe are, uh, uh, there is le a less perceived threat, I guess, of like things like foreign interference and etc. So they're more likely to approve those banks opening in those countries either. But secondly, it is far easier to comply with international regulatory standards that might be different in other countries because you have a board of individuals making those decisions that can balance them with commercial interests as opposed to a government that is far more likely to disproportionately uh, favour a method of far stricter compliance than is perhaps necessary compared to the partners that are issued. And you all weigh this particularly highly for a few reasons. Firstly, because this is just the biggest point of change in this debate because it necessarily expands the reach of Islamic banks in a way that's helpful. But secondly, it means that Muslims in non-Islamic countries are able to access a bank that provides services in alignment with their religion, which is likely to be an incredibly important like guiding point in their life. This is incredibly meaningful for, for a group of people that are generally like marginalized in non-Islamic countries where they're able to access banking services that comply with their religion, comply with their faith, or otherwise look out. You all weigh this incredibly highly. So proud. So, so. <laughs> which means that they're able to do more effect this more effectively. Firstly, notice the immediate contradiction in this argument here. If governments were so well-versed in the many pluralistic interpretations of Sharia law, why would it be that they only centered on one more progressive version, which is the claim given to, uh, that is used to explain why the banking practices might get better? That is already self-defeating within their case. But secondly, we put out a number of reasons why this is untrue. Firstly, governments in many of these jurisdictions are not even elected, which knocks out their sole remaining mechanism about voting. We would say where they are, governments often have perverse incentives to reduce the appearance to which corruption occurs, even if it is occurring. What that means is governments are very happy to call out corruption when it is not their fault, for example, in individual banks, because it looks really good to be like, we discovered an instance of breaking Sharia law and we, your government, have gone in to feel it. But if corruption is occurring within their own government, they obviously have the incentive to conceal that and reduce the risk of the public finding out, which explains why they are more likely to be happy to uncover corruption and do regulation properly under our world. But thirdly, in order to have this kind of, uh, in order to make an interpretation or like a baseline level of argumentation that you have to set, this means that governments must therefore rely on a specific interpretation of Sharia law with which to regulate, which explains why you would block out a number of other interpretations, uh, many of the other ways in which Sharia uh, banks may be able to function with these pluralistic interpretations, which we would say, as I will explain later, is a terrible harm. But uh, finally, we would say even if that is not true, governments often have very strong incentives to pick on singular religious interpretation, often because they might be more powerful, uh, they might be more powerful groups within an individual country with one specific interpretation, which explains why firstly, governments do not have the incentive to regulate themselves well under their side will do this well. Or secondly, they do not have the ability to because of, because they feel but because they feel it is important, uh, they are often like captured by a single religious group, which we will explain is bad. Look at the comparative. First of all, as I've already explained, governments are very happy to call out others others' wrongdoing because it means that they can be seen as fixing it, which is an electoral benefit in cases where uh, you have elections, or is at least a perceptive benefit in cases where you don't, which keeps people happy. But secondly, we explain compliance becomes the point of competition because you can comply with people the, the expectations people have of Sharia law, and you can make that 
a selling point for your bank, which increases the degree to which you do it. Firstly, that looks like things like many customers are having to do their own research, given banking is such a central part of people's lives. I'm sure many people would be happy to sit down and have a look through for half a day. But secondly, people can obviously get religious advice from other religious leaders and their religious communities as to which options would be best for them. And they can also have lots of scrutiny in the media, as we explained in a POI, which explains why these could be done well. That knocks out a lot of the stuff that they try to say about fast class shopping and uh, people wanting to get bonuses. Because as we already explained, a lot of that analysis is beaten by us explaining why you get better regulation under our side, which is why they would not have the ability to kind of fast class shop around. But adding on to that, I would say first of all, individual members of boards now have an incentive to call each other out. Firstly, because they don't want to do the wrong thing by their faith. So if they're like, if they know that the board is fast class shopping to try and get like, to try and have their practices condoned, they're likely to be able to call, they're, they're likely to call that out firstly because of their own faith and their own ideals there. But secondly, because they, because of their own career, again, if you're the one who can be seen to be supporting the degree of competition your bank has with Sharia law and doing it better than other banks, and you're the one who ensures that happening, that is good for your career and it's good that way. But finally, if Bartwas can be bought in the way that, that describes, that obviously nukes their benefits as well, because governments could similarly just ask religious leaders to condone their dodgy practices that might benefit the government but not benefit its citizens, which explains why if this characterization is true, neither side really gets to benefit here because the religious condone, uh, condoning of these religious practices can just be bought out. So I think you have to assume that it's not, in which case we have an independent checking mechanism that is devoid of political uh, devoid of political interference that allows people to operate with, uh, with their proper religious practices closing. Where does the money come from that Islamic banks use to lend out? Well, it comes from people like it comes from people getting services with their bank, and they have that pool of money to be able to use uh, to provide other services to other people. I think, as your opening says, so. But that explains firstly why you get better regulation under our side and immediately that is a debate with the impact for opening opposition because insofar as you believe that we get a better form of regulation that means that every consumer regardless of the individual decisions they want to make has a feeling of safety and a security net they can use when banking so you don't even have to like worry too much about the ways in which consumers make decisions because in every circumstance the framework with which they make those decisions is better and is more secure that already wins opening wow. opposition the debate let's now talk about the ways in which uh, consumers Interact. They, their claim is essentially governments are more progressive, but religious leaders are more conservative. Therefore, governments will do better banking practices. Firstly, it is an assertion that it is good for, and it's always good for individuals to take what they characterize as the progressive progressive form of banking services. Why is it that sometimes it is not, it is bad for customers to access a flat fee service <coughs> instead of renting a product until it becomes theirs? We need to give customers that flexibility so that they can make the options that are best for themselves, especially the most vulnerable types of people that opening government talks about. Those are the people who should be empowered to make decisions based on their own financial circumstances. It is a total assertion. Those are bad in every single instance. And so if you believe their argument, it is unclear why that is even a benefit to them. But additionally, we would say that their own analysis is self-defeating here because they explain why these are really leaders might have different interpretations like one religious leader says no that is corrupt you can't do that but then if the government were to do it they go to other religious leaders who would tell them no no the government's doing it it's fine so if there's different religious leaders with different interpretations why would it not just be that you would not feel you would not feel empowered to listen to both of them and make your own individual decision if you believe that it's true and your kind of i guess decision making calculus is captured by one sole religious leader then i just don't understand why that changes under their side because even if the government is somehow passes more progressive policy that is against the interests of the religious leaders you listen to the religious leader does doesn't suddenly go, oh, everything I've said for the past 20 years is wrong. No, they go, the government has modernized too far. The government has done something that is inappropriate. Yes. You should not allow the government to do this thing and you should uh, go to this, uh, you, you should not interact with their banking stage at all. So we give consumers more ability, uh, the more ability to have choice in the ways that they are. Uh, Go about these banking practices and that is an enormous benefit because it allows people to make the decisions that are best for their financial circumstances that also explains why it's good it is, it is an enormous good to be able to have a pluralistic interpretation of the ways that sharia law interacts in the banking system because it allows consumers the greatest degree of flexibility particularly the types of consumers who already have most a lot of their flexibility locked out because they may be in the minority interpretation of sharia law in those, these countries we say being able to have banks that cater to that specific niche is an enormous benefit for them it allows them a genuine amount of both religious and financial fulfillment. Finally, on how this interacts internationally, they misunderstand our argument. It's that there are millions and uh, hundreds of millions of Muslims not living in Muslim majority countries. And we explain that when you are not related to, you are not governed by central banks, international countries like UK, Australia, the US, are more likely to, uh, to allow you to have international branches in their country because they do not perceive it as government interference. They just perceive you as kind of your individual entity. That is good because the, the hundreds and millions or billions of Muslims that are in these countries are locked out of Islamic banking at the moment, now have the ability to access these services. That is good for their religious fulfillment. And that is a huge, huge number of people that we're able to protect under outside voting opposition.
really matter whether governments are relatively better actors than individual banks. Because when it, when it comes to banking, the most important thing is system-wide consistency of standards. That is what gives you the certainty that actually enables the system to function properly, that enables governments to regulate it properly, to make sure that the entire system doesn't collapse. Two contributions from CG. Firstly, explaining that consistent standards are the most important impact in the debate and why we are better able to achieve them. Secondly, explaining that this makes it much easier to prevent money laundering and terrorism, which is enormous, enormous harm in many of these, in many of these contexts. On the first point about consistent standards, I note that OG's case is contingent on you believing that individual Sharia laws are bad relative to governments. Our extension only needs you to believe that they are different actors who will make different decisions at different levels, which will result in harmful inconsistencies in the system. Firstly, individual levels of Sharia compliance will clash with national banking standards, the financial banking standards. So there's an inherent tension because Sharia law itself tells banks you can't use, you can't take, you know, loan with debt. You can't use a lot of the derivatives that conventional banks use to hedge their risk and make sure that they have, maintain liquidity that they're not going to collapse. But at the same time, the national government, the national regulator, or the prudential regulator, or international Basel banking standards say that you need more capital, you need to raise capital, you need to increase your debt to liquidity ratio, you need to make sure that you're in a better position, which puts these banks in a very untenable position in a lot of in a lot of cases when their Sharia law tells when their Sharia interpretation tells them to be particularly strict about it, because that means they're getting different advice. You're getting situations where maybe they have to take risky actions, like for example, loaning to more risky businesses in terms of, sorry, giving like equity loans to more, ris more risky businesses that are more prone to failure. They, they, are, they are more likely to take on, uh, you know, to take on sort of risky or poor decisions. They are more likely to accept deposits from sort of dubious sources that we'll go into later. Well, that is really, really bad because it means that you get overall much less market inefficiency. You might get much higher risk of contagion and much higher risk of collapse when these standards are inconsistent. On the other hand, when you have the same government that sets the Sharia standard also being the one that sets the financial standard, they, you have a unique capacity to make sure that they actually intersect, that they are in, you know, relatively harmonious, that they are not going to be intentioned and cause banks to have to take untenable decisions to cause banks to fail because there are stricter interpretations out there that cause them to have to go against these existing financial regulations. Regulations, that synergy and coordination is by far the biggest impact in the debate. Because otherwise you've got banks doing all sorts of different things in the economy, which is extremely inefficient, which is extremely risky, which is a much bigger harm than you hear in either opening up team. The second reason it's really important is in terms of access to capital. There are a couple of ways in which this makes it significantly easier. Firstly, people on the ground, as we flag in a POI, don't need to do individual due diligence with every single bank, which is obviously extremely opaque, which is time consuming, which is also quite liable to change on a whim, depending if these boards you know, you know, hire a different religious scholar. That is in contrast to the mechanisms of a central government, which are much slower, which are much more open and transparent, in most cases anyway, but certainly are a lot more consistent and hard to change rapidly, which means people are less likely to be non-compliant. And that doesn't just apply to individual people on the ground, that also applies to businesses, that applies to other financial actors who are you know, moving billions of dollars around, this is an enormous deterrent for them if they can't be confident that the system is going to remain in place, they are going to continue to be compliant with that country's national standards. That looks like international financiers who want to you know, invest or co-invest with Islamic banks or, uh, or you know, open, uh, like open a new bank in this country. It's much easier to determine you're compliant when there are clear national standards rather than every bank doing its own thing with absolutely no oversight, which, is like, like, which I think is just a, a pretty significant harm. You don't have to like... You like if you want to set up a bank, you don't have to like fund, find and then fund a board, which is obviously incredibly time consuming, incredibly expensive, likely pretty politically and religiously controversial in a lot of cases, when the government simply does it for you. So that is a bigger harm than OG's, OG's explanation of sort of financial exploitation, which is contingent on you believing that banks are evil actors. This just explains that it's much easier to get banks functioning, it's much easier to get finance, which I think is a much larger scale impact. It affects literally entire countries' economies, it affects billions of dollars worth of investment, which is obviously much more economic economically influential in the overall material quality of people's lives than if a bank is like, you know, like doing like a bit of, you know, sus usury or whatever. Uh, I think it's also like, you know, I also think, you know, OO mitigate a lot of their harms in a way that our case is, you know, relatively immune to. The third benefit though is that the government just gets access to significantly more data on our side because a lot of these Muslim countries we're talking about are developing. They don't have necessarily the best financial regulators or with, you know, with the most teeth. And often banks are able to be relatively opaque. They hide their, you know, they, 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 cook, they hide their books. They have subsidiaries which make it hard to determine exactly how much money they have in, a lot of, in many cases. So when you're checking things like Sharia compliance, that looks like looking at their balance sheets, looking at their liquidity, looking if they are doing things like loans or taking on particular financial assets, which might be in violation of Sharia standards. 
standards, which just means that central governments get far more information about what these banks are up to. That's really good because it means it's far easier for them to assess the amount of financial risk their system overall is in, how much financial contagion is likely to spread, how you know co-invested and co-dependent various banks in their system are, which is a very unique benefit you don't get when banks individually are in charge of doing this because they have no incentive to share that with the government and there's no capacity to regulate. And that also means that governments are much better able to detect fraud and corruption, which I'll now get onto in my second extension. Before that, opening. It's better to have a diversified banking industry because in times of financial crisis, you don't have every bank relying on the same now volatile financial services. But it's not dependent on the same, like, that's not what your uh, case does. You don't get the same financial services. Like, ha having all banks compliant with the same standards doesn't mean every bank is identical or invested in the same assets. Like, that, that, that AI just doesn't work. So, extension number two, why is it easy to prevent money laundering and terrorism when governments are setting GRA compliance laws? So there are three things I would note about why many Islamic banks are likely to take deposits from bad actors do things like money laundering. Firstly, there are different religious interpretations of what constitutes terrorism and what morality is, whether banks should act as financial intermediaries. Secondly, many people within the Islamic banking system also have personal interest and personal religious interest, which might cause them to want to care about these things. Thirdly, because these Islamic banks cannot issue debt, they are extremely capital constrained, which means they're often very small and very, 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 very you know, in, uh, have a very strong incentive to raise money by whatever means necessary. Otherwise, they are at risk, more risk of collapsing. They don't have a lot of ability to you know, function, offer services to customers, etc. Which means these countries are very likely to take on, to take on you know, deposits and tra transfer money on behalf of actors who may be pretty morally dubious. That means that Islamic banks are financing pretty horrific acts around the globe that hurt millions of people. And that, that's relatively easy because Islamic banking uses a different system of money transfers to conventional banking. Like if you send a money, money transfer through Western Union, they physically take the money. Whereas with Islamic banking, if like I want to send $5,000 to Malaysia, I pay the Islamic bank in Australia $5,000. And then the Islamic bank in Malaysia pays $5,000 to who I want to go to. The money doesn't actually get physically transferred, which means it's much easier to hide it and cook the books and you know make sure that, that and, and you know lie about that. And harder to regulate than a conventional banking system is. That is bad for these countries for three reasons. Firstly, it means they get more terrorism, which is obviously incredibly disruptive, kills a lot of people. Secondly, they get financially blacklisted by the Financial Action Task Force and International Basel Standards, which is obviously devastating for their economy. And thirdly, because of money laundering, you get more crime and less tax revenue for the government. Central governments have far more incentive to fix this problem because even bad governments care about terrorism and not having enough tax money. That's why we propose. <laughs> on closing government's extensions and then on the rest of the debate and about liberalisation. Firstly, on closing government's extensions. Unfortunately, weighing your extensions does not make them more plausible than they already were, and these extensions just don't work. The first one is about consistency, and they say it's a problem right now, banks might take riskier loans than each other, and that's really bad. Four reasons why this is just not a reasonable claim to make in this debate. Firstly, this uh, having different banks regulate their own Sharia law does not take away from overarching prudential regulations that exist in the country. And the states have exactly the same incentive to stop risky behavior because they don't want to have to bail out banks either way. So it's just deeply unclear that they will stop trying to regulate just because these banks are regulating their own Sharia law here. But the second thing you would say is notably on their side of the house, they probably take away capacity to regulate this because you create, as they acknowledge in the context that states have relatively less financial power or relatively less capacity to regulate, an entirely new body that then has to take a lot of resources into a step standardizing all of the Sharia law systems of each of these banks, which means therefore that's probably some capital taken away from the rest of the prudential regulation system, which means that you know, you're trying to standardize things in this way, but even when banks potentially undermine these regulations as they suggest they might try to do under their side of the house, you've just left the capacity to investigate that there. The third thing we would just note is though, non-Islamic banks around the world don't have these religious uh, restrictions on what they can and can't do and the products that they offer and the way in which they invest. And they seem to be pretty fine when they change decisions and they do different things in this world. So it just doesn't seem to be that clear that banks making divergent decisions is actually that bad. But finally, OMG kind of says that there are well-known ways in which banks can get around charging interest by you know, having flat rate fees for like taking money out or whatever, things like that. The biggest area of this debate is likely just investment that banks can make and doing investments that aren't haram, which just seems really unclear that banks making different investments or restricting their investments in different ways is just actually that damaging or that kind of unclear, uh, you know, is actually that damaging or that risky. Like the vast majority of this debate is just about restricting banks from doing different things. But finally, we just explained to you in Jordan's extension that banks just right now lack choice and capacity to invest 
invest in the way that they want, which is also risky in its own way because it locks banks into particular industries that might fail at certain points. We just give them greater capacity and freedom to make their own choices and that probably mitigates some of this harm as well. That's why the first thing about consistency is out. The second claim is about data. Uh, it's just unclear why you couldn't just have laws that would require transparency from these companies to real law boards. So it's just kind of not particularly comparative here. And again, we say the capacity to regulate is probably symmetric. It's probably worse under their side of the house when you have to spend a lot of money to create a centralized board as opposed to just requiring banks on their own to give public inf uh, data and information where, it's, where, it's, uh, where it exists. Second thing is on terrorism. They say there's an incentive for these banks to help terrorism. But unfortunately, I think in the explanation of that extension, they sort of undermine their own ability to solve it, which is that they identify the problem with terrorism in a lot of instances is specific is specific and inherent to the way that Islamic banks operate, the way in which they transfer money overseas and stuff like that. Which means the problem is not with Sharia law regulation, it's just with the fact that terrorism is difficult to regulate in the first place, right? You're still likely to do things like have terrorist organizations use dubious name and source money through particular different circumstances, which means just having centralized regulation does not fix that problem in the first place. Once again, we tell you at the point at which you split regulation between two different bodies, once again, you probably lack the ability and the capital to be able to regulate that here. So yes, stopping terrorism might be a good thing, but it's just deeply unclear that they do stop terrorism at the point at which they say the problem is with the way in which money is transferred, not ultimately in the way in which banks, uh, not ultimately in the way in which banks make decisions. Um, okay, on our extension, I just want to be very clear. I think Jordan's pretty clear in her speech as to why banks would likely be making significantly more profit than they would be alternatively. Notably, this is very important because both opening teams acknowledge that there are, uh, government teams acknowledge that there is a capital constraint for banks right now. Obviously, it is very good if these banks have more money because it means that they can do things that are actually cheaper for consumers, which gets around a lot of the problems of exploitation for opening of this opening government that exists, say, exists in the status quo. OO is just not very specific in this debate about what banks would actually be able to do to maximize their profit alternatively. Their claims are made largely about corruption. We give you far more clear claims about what banks would be able to do outside of kind of corrupting government forces that would be able to access this here. Say, what? firstly, you'd be able to probably in some instances charge business interest on their businesses' interest on their loans here, which would be a massive revenue source for these banks, because uh, obviously you probably have some interpretations in which that was acceptable, which obviously means therefore you can get a much more money in your bank as well. Secondly, we explain that you can invest in vice industries. And yes, it's probably not true that, in it's probably true that perhaps investing in yogurt might be a better investment than investing in dildo but probably investing in alcohol is a more reliable investment than investing in uh, yogurt here. And Jordan explained these vice industries are often very resilient in times of financial crisis or trouble. But we've also pointed to things like resource extraction, for example, being something that is historically very, very, uh, very, very profitable. But these banks cannot regulate in the status quo, are unlikely to regulate due to religious and culturally religious capture and ideas and what should be the kind of state's moral purview over banks in the circumstances. But what is able to be which what banks would be able to do in some circumstance if they can get their own like kind of liberal understanding interpretations of Sharia law. We'd also tell you though that it would allow banks to invest in non-Islamic financial institutions as well, which they cannot do in the status quo and they are unlikely to be able to do with central regulation, which also gives them another realm in which they can increase their profits. Obviously, not all of these things would increase their profits. We allow banks to do things that would maximize their profits here that are artificially restricted in the status quo and inherently have to be defended as being artificially restricted under their side of the house. Why is it so important that banks can make profits? Firstly, given they tell you stuff about capital constraints, we'd say, awesome, less need for bailouts at the point at which banks are richer and have more ways to insure themselves from those failures. That is a huge benefit in this debate given both government teams tell you why that's so bad. But secondly, it is just very good to be able to give people credit. We would say exploitative systems in the status quo like charging huge amounts of money up front to get a loan are really bad for people who would otherwise be able to afford lower interest rates that will be generated by having banks having larger profits in these circumstances. So that's really awesome as well. But also you have foreign investment that now goes to domestic Islamic institutions as opposed to foreign banks operating in these countries as well, which improve the domestic uh, banking industry here. Take closing. Our claim is not that regulation doesn't exist in status quo, it's that it's much harder to implement and enforce when every bank plays by different rules rather than the same. Every rules. bank plays by different rules in the West because they all have different products and regular and things that they invest in, in the first place. But also your capacity to regulate is just far decreased at the point at which you're running two different uh, like big banking operations. Do you still have a prudential regulation authority and incentive to regulate under our side of the house? So those are kind of really beneficial things about increasing product right, profit, right? And we should say it's crucial that people are able to get increased access to credit under our side of the house. Notably, we way over opening opposition here because we engage in context in which competition is the most likely to occur, which is in major financial centers where these big banks are likely to operate. And we explain the benefits much more clearly as to banks being able to access this money. We explain there is a benefit to the regular everyday person of the Islamic bank they bank with having access to more money. Jordan explained very clearly in her speech, I think it's been explained very clearly as well, why the people that OG says are likely to be coerced under their side of the house are equally likely to be coerced in both worlds, right? If you listen to your religious figure and that religious figure tells you that they support stronger restrictions on banks, you still 
actual engagement that's going into the personal level. So those people do not matter in the debate. They are, be, they are like likely to be coerced religiously in either side of the house. The difference is, we explain to you that we give people far more access to liberal interpretations of Islam. The point which you have big financial institutions bankrolling liberal scholars who give you an understanding of Islamic banking that is more liberal than your alternative. You give people agency to opt out of that religious coercion that exists in the status quo. We help profit, we help people so proud to oppose.